We are dismissing you for Children's Church at this time. If you're not sure where to go, up the stairs and across the mezzanine, and uh, Miss Heather will meet you down there with the class she has prepared for you today. So, man, it is great to be back. Uh, my family and I have been off for three weeks, uh, traveling around the country and kind of just taking in some of the beauty of God's creation, and it was awesome. Uh, we, we covered about 5,000 miles in about 14 days, so we did a lot of driving um, through the Dakotas and Wyoming and Montana, the, seeing some of the beauties of the West that all my life I've wanted to go see and just always had had things get in the way of it. And so I'm so thankful that we've had, finally had an opportunity to do that. And uh, boy, you stand at the base of some of those mountains that rise to 11,000, 12,000, 13,000 feet above sea level, and if that doesn't just drink in the grandeur of God. I, I don't know what does. And uh, it was amazing. Um, I, I tear up every time I talk about it because we're, we're, we're all done. And we, we thought, well, okay, we're gonna, our, our trip was done and we're heading back. And there's a few days of uh, travel to get back home. And uh, we thought, you know what, let's just take one extra day. And so we, we pulled the camper out in the middle of the boondocks. Um, that's dry camping. That's where there's nothing to plug into, um, if, if, for those of you that aren't aware of it. And uh, so we, we pulled onto the, this, this area in the, uh, the National Forest properties that, that sits right on the edge of the Badlands. And you're, like, you're literally, your camper is here, and the Badlands just drop off and flow out away from right where you're at. And so we're sitting there, camper's uh, right on the edge there. We got our chairs out, and the sun's going down. We took a drive through the Badlands themselves as the sun was setting, and beautiful, gorgeous sunset our last night out there. And as it was dropping over the horizon, in the west, out of the east, comes the, the blue moon, super moon, rising up over the Badlands. And so that came up and just cast its shadow across it. And I just sat there thinking, look, God, you are so amazing. Just, just be able to bask in and, and drink that up. And, and then we, we finished our route, came back home. But um, it, was just, it was just wonderful to have that opportunity. And so this is our Back to Church Sunday, not because I'm back to church, but... <laughs> Because, but because uh, uh, typically we have the hiatus for, the, for our children's programs throughout the summer because of vacations, traveling, and the and, and way to get, the, you know, things uh, are just, you know, people enjoy life, and there's not, absolutely nothing wrong with that. But we like to celebrate returning and, and being able to teach and train our children and to have our families uh, come back in, and so it's just it's great to be here. Uh, Proverbs 1 7 says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. That's where it all starts. Now, I'm not talking about the fear of the Lord as in, oh, I'm afraid of you, God, but an awe inspired reverence to his majesty. The fact that he is a righteous, perfect, just being. The fear of the Lord. That's where all knowledge begins itself. To understand that there is a God and that you and I are not He. He's a real entity who is perfect and wonderful. But fools, they despise wisdom. They reject instruction. They don't want to hear things that are good for them. Our passage today is going to be from the book of Psalms, Psalms chapter 1. Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditates on his law day and night. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers. Not so the wicked. They are like chaff that the wind blows away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners stand in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked leads to destruction. So there are several things in this passage that, that as I read through it, that just jump out every time I do. The first thing of note in the passage to me is the downward spiral that takes place with the way we choose to, to live. First, you're walking with the wicked. Pretty soon, you're just standing. And then, you're just sitting 
with those that mock. You're going nowhere. There's no progression. You were an active, engaged being. You came to a dead stop, and now you're sitting. You, know, you are known by the company you keep. Uh, that, that ha Birds of a feather flock together. That's just the way it is. Um, and you're influenced by that company. And it has a mark on you. If you're not careful, you begin sliding toward that negative influence. And things become less shocking the more you're exposed to things. If you don't think that's true, turn off your television, commercial TV, streaming services, shut it off for a week or a month and then turn it back on. And you will lay like, wait a minute, I was watching that? Put, a, put aside the books that you're reading for, for a period of time and then pick them back up and take a look. If you don't think that there is a, a downward slide of the conscience with the company you keep, shut off some of those things that are a little less negative for a while and then come back to them and see if you embrace them with the same fervor that you did when you shut them off. I'm going to tell you, that it happens. This is why Scripture says that there's no blessing in walking with those things. Rather, it leads to destruction. The second thing that I want you to notice about the passage today is that there are two distinct groups of people. It talks about the righteous and the wicked. And you're in one or the other camp. This is what Jesus said. You can't. How long are you going to try and ride the fence? You can't. You're either in or you're out. There's only one of two places that you can land. Righteous or wicked. There's a correct way to live. There's an incorrect way to be. There's an absolute moral authority. It's God. There are absolutes in this world, no matter how much we wish there weren't. They're established by an absolutely righteous God, a God who is just. And so you can either accept it or you can reject it. You can say, yes, there is a God, or you can be a mocker and say, there is no God. I am my own God. I make everything that is. The only thing that matters is what I can do and what benefits me. Now, I understand that that kind of religious rhetoric today, if you will, is rapidly becoming labeled hate speech. And it is. In fact, there's, there's countries today where that, that simple proclamation can get you prosecuted. And if you're not watching out, it's coming to America. I mean, the, the legislature in California just passed, the governor has not signed it yet, but has just passed legislation that if a parent does not recognize the transitional gender of their child, the state will have the right to take that child away. Again, not signed by the governor yet, but their, their House and Senate, their, their two chambers of state legislature have passed that as law. There is a downward slide when you start to embrace the things of the world. The third thing I want you to notice about this is that there's a distinct outcome for each of those groups. Those two groups exist. There's righteous and there's wicked. And there is an outcome for them. The righteous, God watches over them. God, I don't know how else to, he's paying attention to you. And again, not in a way that, oh, like I saw this bumper sticker while we were traveling this week. It's, it's a, Jesus is leaning out of the trunk and it says, I saw that. <laughs> well, that's kind of cool. But <laughs> not in that way. I mean, he did see it. He sees everything. But um, God watches over like a parent, a grandparent, a guardian that is, is watching over a child who's paying attention to what's going on so that they can protect them from danger, so they can see them getting too close to the edge of something and be able to rein them back in. God watches over them. That's the first thing. The righteous, they're also, they become like a tree that's planted by the water. I don't know, how many of you grow an orchard? We bought our place out in uh, south of Luzerne. If you know anything about that terrain, it's all sand. And if you ever try to grow a tree in sand, 
You can do it, but it takes a ton of water. You have to water and water and water and water. You have to continue to reinforce the soil so that it will hold moisture. But the righteous, they're like a tree that's planted right next to the source of water. The roots run deep. They're constantly tapped in. This is one of the benefits to being the righteous. Their leaves never fade. And in due season, they bring forth the fruit that they're supposed to bring forth. Now, I say it all the time that um, God has a purpose for your life. Scripture is very clear about that. He has a plan. He has a purpose. You're part of that plan. And there is fruit that you're to bring forth. But it's your fruit. It's not your neighbor's fruit. It's not your sister's fruit. It's not your parents' fruit. It's not anybody else's fruit. It's, it's your fruit. You have a specific uniqueness about you. DNA proves that. Fingerprints prove that. You are a unique individual that God has a purpose and plan for. And in due season, the righteous will bring forth whatever that fruit is if they live righteously. The wicked, they're not so, Scripture says. There's a distinct outcome for them. While they may prosper for a minute, Scripture's very clear. They are like chaff. They'll be blown away. There is nothing that will hold them. They will be unable to stand crumpling before judgment, alone, separated from the company of the righteous. The way of the wicked, it says, leads to destruction. And it will take its toll. So the fourth thing I want you to look at here is that there, notice that there's a requirement for the righteous. There's a requirement to be proactive as a righteous person. You don't just get to be, hey, I made it, I'm in. I'm all set. Proverbs 22, 3 says, The prudent sees danger and takes refuge. But the simpleton keeps going and pays the price. The requirement that's needed is to be engaged, to be moving forward, to be proactive. Who are the ones that are blessed according to this passage? The ones who love the law of God and who meditate on it day and night. There is a, a need to be engaged with the law of God. Now, it says to love the law of God. You know, and, and Scripture tells us, and we know from our own personal lives that nobody likes being corrected. You know, well, many, I don't know, for me, like somebody wants to tell me, say, hey, what you need to do, you know, the hackles come up, right? You know, what, what you should do and sometimes it's sage advice. But what's, your, what's the initial reaction to that kind of stuff? Just think about it for a second. Maybe you're not like me. Maybe you're all really good about that. I don't know. But <laughs> you need to be engaged in it. And not only love the law, know that, hey, there's something in here for me. I can learn from what God has to say, but uh, to meditate on it day and night. In other words, to take it in. To have it be a part of our fiber. Elsewhere, the psalmist writes, Your word, Lord, I've hidden in my heart for a reason. That I might not sin against you. That I might not offend you, God. I read your word. I take it in. I meditate on it. I have implanted it in me for the sole purpose of not being offensive to you, God. See, we need to be engaged in moving forward with this because... My, my, my college coach, Coach Grinke, he used to always say this. He said, you're, you're either you're getting better or you're getting worse. Nobody stays the same. He said, you know, you're never where you were. It's a, so he would ask you, what have you done today to get better, to get stronger, to get faster, to become a, a more complete person, to become more like Christ? What have you done today? Have you moved which way? Because you can't just stay the same. You either grow or you deteriorate. So which direction are, are you being moved in and, and what's causing that to happen? So this is why our passage today is, to me, I feel is, is very important. It, it gives us a means by which our decisions need to be informed. An understanding by, by, by where we need to tread and how we need to go. So we, we took this trip and we're driving around and, and um, I didn't take... I don't want to, okay, well, we won't even go into there. I, got, I have two trucks, they're different manufacturers. The one that has the great navigation system, we didn't take. We took the one that has no navigation system. 
So I had my phone's navigation system. I'm just going to tell you, Google lies. Okay? I'll just be honest with you about that. So we're, you know, I don't have a clue where we're going, right? And so, but, you know, you get in the habit of just following along with the, someone who's supposed to know something. So you plug it in there, and, and you just, you find yourself just following the blue line. And, you know, we come out of this one camp, and we're, we're making our way out. And, and so we come out of this one camp, and we make a, a left-hand turn. A 90-degree left-hand turn. We go a mile, we make another right, uh, uh, 90 degree left-hand turn. We go two miles and make a 90-degree left-hand turn, and we do it again. And I'm thinking to myself, where are my math majors in here? 490 degrees gives you what? 360. That's a whole circle, right? We should be right back where we started, only a mile over. And I'm like, this is not even right. And so then we hit a dead-end road and a dirt road, and I'm like, okay, get out the map. <laughs> Give me the book. And I start going through the map, and I'm like, this is where we are. This is where we need to be. What roads make that happen? And, and, and kind of push that away. Because the, the, the point is that you can either navigate by the GPS, or you can navigate with a map that actually gives you a broad overview. There's good advice to follow, and there's bad advice to follow. It's always better have a, have a, at least have a broad overview of where you're at, where you're trying to get to, than to just blindly follow somebody. And I'm a, I, I say that because there are so many so-called gurus out there that, uh, you know, people just blindly follow. I'm telling you, don't ever blindly follow me. Because sometimes I don't know where I'm going. It just happens. All right? Vet things out. Check them out. Check them out against what? Against the Word of God. How does it match up and line up with this, this law that I have studied on and meditated on and implanted in my heart? Because what guides you directly impacts your destination. And there's good guides and there's bad guides. So what are some of the bad guides in the world today? Well, the world itself is a bad guide, I'm just going to tell you. The world is ever ready to tell you what you should and what you should not do. They got all kinds of things. But worldly wisdom, I'm going to tell you, is demonic. It is not God leading worldly wisdom. It is, a, it is a demonic spirit whose goal is to seek and destroy and to devour you, to lead you into utter destruction, to drag you ultimately and literally to the depths of hell. Worldly wisdom strives to blind you, first of all, to the revelation that there is a God. The words of the ungodly can sound right. They can act, you know, anybody can get up and, and put on a good front and make you think that, hey, they know where they're going. But Scripture said, blessed is the one who does not listen to the counsel of the ungodly. The world's a bad guide. Natural desire is a bad guy, guide also. What do I mean by natural desire? Well, in, in modern storytelling, it's follow your heart. Let your heart, if you're true to your heart, you will be all that you're supposed to be. That leads you away from God. In fact, that is the, if you, anytime you hear the church word sin, if you can replace that with selfish, you will be pretty close to getting an accurate understanding of that. My sin nature is my selfish nature. It is the nature that says, I want what benefits me. I want what's in it for me. And that leads me away from God because God's ultimate view, ultimate goal is always for your best interest. God created a perfect world. He planted man in it. And, and by man, I mean humanity. And in it was supposed to be all that you would ever need. And it was selfishness, sin, that got in the way of that. Oh, wait a minute. If I do this, I could be like God? Then I wouldn't need God. Then I could make my own rules. Then I could follow my own heart. Then I could decide what's right and what's best for me. Natural desire leads us away from God. And this was the whole reason there was a need for the cross to begin with. Christ's death and resurrection on the cross provided the means for us to overcome 
selfishness. Not just to be washed clean of all that we've done wrong, not just to be able to, and that's a great thing, but, but our sinful nature becomes crucified with Christ. Our desire becomes dead and buried, and then it is Christ living in me that steps forward. And so with the cross, I'm able to become Christ-like. Without the cross, there's no ability to crucify the selfish. There's no way to put to death the things that get in the way. And so we end up following our heart. This is what the whole transgender ideology teaches. In my heart, I'm a different person than in my biology. And I acknowledge that, that I have biology that says one thing, but my heart tells me I'm something else. Jeremiah 17, 9 says, The heart is deceitful above all other things and is desperately wicked. Following your heart is a horrible idea. It's a bad guide. It will lead you to destruction because it leads you in direct opposition to the law of God. Without the cross of Christ, we become then militant sinners. People who are blatantly in violation of God's law. The more you, you think or live in the darkness, the more the light becomes something you detest. This is why the world mocks and hates Christianity today. Because of the biblical teachings that we, we hold fast to. Because of what we teach. Because we say that homosexuality, a sin. Premarital sex, also a sin. Same-sex marriages, yep, they're a sin too. Transgenderism, still a sin. But the world says we need to embrace these things. I'm going to tell you, my heart breaks for people who are predatorily preyed upon and drawn in to a world that is totally contradicting what God's law says. And it's become more and more and more aggressive in our culture today. And there is a push more and more and more to grab and to, to latch onto and to water down society's understanding of right and wrong. And if you don't think there's an all-out war uh, from a, a demonic force that wants nothing more than to get your, their hands on your children, you're kidding yourself. And they're pulling them into a destructive lifestyle that some of these lifestyles, they, yeah, that's a 40% suicidal ideation lifestyle. It's a horrible place to be. It's a dark world. And we need to pray and to stand boldly and to teach and to train that the Word of God is something that can't be rewritten and bent to the culture of today. Unchecked, these bad guides lead us to individual destruction. And they do. But they also lead us into societal destruction. And they undermine and they tear apart the very fabric of a, of a civil society, ultimately moving us to a culture that's completely surrendered to hedonism. What do I mean by hedonism? Well, the hedonistic lifestyle, that's, that is simply the pursuit of pleasure. The sensual self-indulgence. It's the priority of most of the world's wisdom today. Nothing else matters but my pleasure. Nothing in this world counts but, but what satisfies me. Seeking happiness and joy now uh, in, in and of itself. And that, that, that's not a bad thing. There's nothing wrong with, with enjoying vacation time. There's nothing wrong with pursuit of, of, of financial gain. There's nothing wrong with having nice things. That's not the, the issue. But when the pursuit of those selfish things become the, are advanced at the expense of all other virtue, that's where the problem comes in. And that's where the cross then becomes irrelevant or unnecessary. I don't need to be made right because there's nothing wrong with my selfish pursuits. And if one is totally unaware of a need for repentance, how would they ever know to do it? And so it kind of just brings us full circle today as I wrap this up. You know, welcome back to Church Sunday, where the Word of God is boldly proclaimed, and hopefully the desire to know Him is ignited in each one of us. And that we have a desire to learn and know what God's will and purpose is for each individual and to be able to encourage one another as we move through this world.
And I, my, my prayer is that, you know, as, as we welcome these kids back in today and, and, and they're here and they're going to go out and play and, and enjoy some, some fun-filled things, that, that we don't lose sight of the fact that it's about instilling the Word of God in the heart of each individual that they might know who He is and walk with Him in all that they do throughout all of their lives. May God bless you through the hearing of his word. Amen. Let us pray. Loving God, we come to you today again just thankful that you have given to us a revealed will of you through your word, that we can know your heart, Lord, and that we can experience a life with you. Lord, I pray that you strengthen each of us in our walk with you and that you draw us ever more into a, a, an awe-inspired understanding of who you are and a desire to know you better through your word, Lord, I pray in the name of Christ. Amen.